welcome uh, to these uh, controversies in uh, laser treatments in uh, 2021. Uh, this is a sponsored event. We thank Quantel uh, not only for organizing this symposium, but also for inviting us to uh, present in it. Uh, we are three speakers today, uh, Professors uh, Victor Chong, Victor Wu, and myself. Uh, we present on uh, laser treatments of uh, retinal diseases as well as uterus floaters. We'll start with uh, Professor Victor Chong. Uh, Victor is uh, very well known to all of you. Uh, Victor is currently Global Head of uh, Medicine Retina at uh, Beringer Ingerheim. From September 2021, he'll become Global Head of Retina R&D at Janssen Labs in the US. And he is currently president of the new sub-threshold ophthalmic laser society. No better than Victor Chong uh, to deliver the following lecture. Victor, many thanks for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak to you on macular laser photocoagulation today. And I think the talk is about whether it's still relevant in uh, 2021. And um, I think the one we need to focus on that we need to put in that some years ago, macular laser is the only available treatment. Now we have the additional option. So instead of thinking about that we should stop using laser or we should only use uh, other therapy, I think that we're thinking about the how it's relevant in 2021 and how to use those different things in combination. And indeed, anti magic therapy uh, is very useful therapy. And But I think that laser is still relevant. And I'm going to share with you uh, my, uh, my talk today. So this is my financial disclosure. I'm an employee for Boringer. And uh, this talk is not endorsed by Boringer and it's not very, really relevant uh, from uh, for, uh, from a topic point of view, but it's slightly more relevant. I'm a consultant for Quantum Medical, and which is a laser manufacturer. And I'm also a founder and director of Uretina Limited, which is a device company to providing uh, a therapy for a small device for therapy for early DMD and intermediate AMD. Again, probably not relevant to what we're discussing today. So the question number one is, I heard a lot of uh, my European and Asian colleagues said that, oh, when I went to a US conference, they say that they don't use laser anymore. And so I think the first question was, well, do our US colleagues actually still use laser or not? So I think that, you know, we can answer that question by looking at a study that was uh, published a few years ago and uh, comparing the three different type of anti vegetables and again, it is focusing on diabetic macular edema and so-called the protocol T. If you're looking at the baseline characteristic at the time, that um, you know there is about 600 patients was included in the study, and but you can see that about 36 to 39 percent, uh, more than one third of patients actually have laser before they join the truck to join the study. And I think I recall that at the time that um, they were really keen for patients that who were not. Uh, treated uh, uh, to join the study, but yet there is quite a number of patients that would have the uh, have start, have laser before. And then again, if you're looking at that, they uh, in the study in the first year they need about uh, just under ten injection, uh, all had more than nine. And then, uh, but you when you look at that, you know um, how many that uh, still require laser treatment despite the nine or, or ten injection. And I can see he did anything from 37 to 56%. So again, you know, it's something that when we think about that, you started with a well, third of patient have laser, you start thinking uh, you end up to have another half the patient is still need laser during the first year despite 10 injection. And I think that what can we can conclude is that, you know, even in a quite recent US study, laser is still carried out in the majority of patients. Now, don't get me wrong, as I mentioned in the introduction, that I think anti is extremely useful to our patient to, in our management. And, but I think that, you know, how laser they actually still use uh, in that circumstances. So the question number two would be that who should we treat with laser and how should we deal with patient, um, you know, when, they, when they, have, they come to us in a different stage of the disease. And go back to one study that I was involved in, uh, which is a bit older study now, but it's one of the original study that have uh, really comparing three different groups. Unlike some of the study that you use anti first and then you only use laser uh, later. And in this study, you had a pure uh, separate, uh, pure uh, randomization. In other words, what I mean by that is we've got one group 
have Lucentis uh, ranibizumab alone. You have another group, uh, all of them would have uh, ranibizumab as well as active laser. And then one group that will only have active laser. So I think it's, it's really that to compare those three uh, scenarios when we actually, uh, when the patient come into us, when they have DME uh, with, uh, with some degree of loss of vision. Again, I don't want to bore with the fine detail, but just to highlight that, um, you know, if you're looking at um, the, uh, the differences, the different groups, when they were looking at the level of edema. So to your left, that when you have less than 300 micron, I better in mind, this is uh, on the time domain, that is quite old study, I uh, accept that. And so that was in the modern day, like say Heidelberg would be like equivalent to around 350. And even at that level of edema, you can actually see that um, the, um, the free group are, really don't differ very much. And on the far end that yes, when you got a more than 400, so in modern scale, more than 450 or so, that yes, definitely, there's no doubt that anti uh, uh with or without laser are superior to laser alone. But even in the middle group that uh, considering the number of laser required, and actually that you can still debate whether that laser will be still a valid option on its own. However, that no, no doubt that laser uh, would be beneficial uh, in some of those patients. Similarly, then when you actually look at a um, patient that uh, he, um, who, uh, whether that they should have combination or not. And the thing to think about it, if this is a study with patients who are DME, and you can argue that those who have pyre laser, uh, in the fact that those are the laser failure already. And indeed that quite a lot of my patients who have laser don't need any further, uh, don't have DME anymore. And therefore that they would not actually join the study. So I think you need to put that into perspective. And again, in here, that for those laser failure, then you probably do a combination would not necessarily particularly helpful as shown here. And then uh, Lucenda's on its own, uh, clearly showing superiority. However, you never have laser before, a combination seems to be slightly better. And although it is not statistically significant, but numerically better. So I think that, you know, we, we need to think about uh, how do we treat patient, uh, that is something that we put into consideration. And more recently, that the question was that, what if you got good vision and central you more DME, that what you want to go and do about it? And I think a lot of people would quote the protocol V, and those are patients with DME and 2025 or better vision. And again, you probably heard about the fact that, you know, you should just observe as, as, as good as, um, you know, using anti -vagic. But I think that what is not often highlighted that in uh, this particular study, that there is laser group. And that in fact, that what happened that as you can see in this graph here, that um, laser reduced the risk of ileal injection requirement from 20, from 36% from to 26%. And that is a 34% reduction. And bearing in mind, laser is a relatively straightforward procedure, but if you're reducing something for 34%, you would expect that people would talk a lot more about it, but you probably have not really heard that. And therefore, that might be something that uh, people decided that laser is actually not needed. Now, what the um, you know what we need to think about is that all that I show you so far are with standard laser. And indeed, that um, in the society that we are now formed uh, in the sub threshold uh, laser society, of our laser society that we really want to improve that from standard laser and how can we do better? And again, today we might not be have a, um, a, a long discussion with some, some liminal laser, and, but again, you probably know quite a lot about it already. And uh, the laser energy deliver impulses and, and they give less collateral retro damage and then no visible scarring. And I think that is something that uh, we can show you a very quick example with an edema there and with exodate and fluorescein angiogram showing microaneurysm and which was leaking and then OCT showing the edema and then you can then have the laser and this patient only have one subliminal laser and then four months later the edema gradually go away and so is the exodate and then slowly that 12 months later that all the exodates goes away and then uh, you would not see any scar uh, formation and similarly that uh, you know an OCT that will show the benefit that way. So I think that to summarizing the uh, laser for DME, so I think that um, you know, laser is still used in real life and even in the US. Um, and then when you're actually looking at the claim data that yes, laser use have reduced. However, that better in mind, the anti-VEGF use have increased substantially. 
So I think that you need to kind of considering that uh, both treatment uh, are coexisting. And these are similar to antiviral drug in early DME. And so when you only got mildly involved with uh, thickness, but if you've got to come, come with a patient who got very thick retina, and I think antiviral drug is something that we should consider. However, that even for those with thick retina, that um, if they were never been treated with laser before, and then I think a combination treatment is still justified. And however, that I would not use conventional laser and I would use subliminal laser. And as already mentioned that in DMU with very good vision, and again, observation is an option. However, that laser can reduce the risk for anti vegetative therapy for more than 33%. So this thing's something that consider. And again, as I mentioned that all those evidence I showed you are on DRCL net uh, clinical trial. And we believe that subliminal laser might improve the outcome further. So what about uh, another condition? So is there any other things that subliminal laser to, uh, able to use? Now for this, uh, for today, I only only go to choose one more condition. I think there's a few other things that subliminal can, can use, but certainly for CSR is really a very good option. As you can see here, there is a local leakage point and um, you, know, you can just do the laser and it's quite straightforward. And then you can actually see the result um, with, uh, with, with the, uh, treatment uh, very very straightforward and very easy to do. And there's another case that you this case of a much chronic uh, uh, edema and actually that they got flipping noise material and even those chronic cases that um, you know you can still have a very fast resolution of the of the uh, of the fluid as well as the flipping noise and material. And then if you have another case that this is really close to full viewer, Phobia, a lot of people were concerned about that. And again, with uh, uh, ability for no scarring treatment, and you can able to do that and then actually have a good success for that as well. This is a chronic cases with uh, more than two years of history of chronic CSR, and actually previously had the photodynamic therapy uh, already. And yet that, you know, you can see that there is the, uh, still uh, diffuse leakage in the fluorescein, and then also that have a plaque um, in the ICG. And again, in those cases that um, you know, treating with micropulse laser and uh, covering the whole entire uh, LPE leakage area, and then um, you know you can uh, using a very similar protocol that we devised for the DME, and also show very good result. So in conclusion, that diabetic in um, in diabetic macular edema as well as central serous retinopathy, laser is still very relevant in twenty twenty one. I would emphasize that antiviral is extremely useful in diabetic macular edema. And indeed, that sometimes I do use PDT for central serous retinopathy as well. However, that you know the, the hassle, the expense, and sometimes that you can't even get the drug anymore and make you think that why don't that you uh, use um, uh, subliminal laser first? And if you turn out that to be not successful, then you can go for PDT. And indeed, I have patients that who have PDT elsewhere and refer to me, and then they will not respond to PDT and then work successfully in uh, central series. I think that is certainly a case that, that uh, we don't know which one of those two are better, but I think in some circumstances that we can actually see the benefit of a micropulse laser and a subliminal laser. Thank you very much for your attention, and that will be the end of my talk. talk. It is a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Li Te Wu. Uh, Li Te is Associate Professor at the University of Costa Rica and Director of the Asociados de Macula e Vitre Retina de Costa Rica in San Jose, Costa Rica. Uh, Li Te is an undergraduate uh, uh, did his undergraduate studies at Cornell University, then Tulane University School of Medicine, Pew Research Fellowship at the Rockefeller University in New York, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, where he did an internship, Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York, where he did his ophthalmology residency. He's been at the National Retin Institute in Baltimore under Drs. Uh, Glaser and Murphy, where he did the Vitro Fellowship. And he's a, a fully certified uh, surgeon by the American Board of Ophthalmology. Lite is a, it's a privilege to share this symposium with you. Many thanks. Thank you, Paolo, for the main introduction. So today I will be talking to you on whether or not to use anti-VEGFs versus uh, pan retinal photocoagulation for uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. 
Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, of which uh, Quantel Medical is relevant, since it's a laser and Bayer as well, both of them are relevant. So uh, this audience already knows that PDR, if left untreated, is a leading cause of blindness. Up to 24,000 new cases of diabetic retinopathy induced blindness occurs each year in the US. So worldwide, that number has to be multiplied many fold. And without treatment around half of these eyes with high risk proliferative diabetic retinopathy will experience severe vision loss within five years. So uh, this is a study back from the 70s, uh, late 70s, early 80s, the DRS, which showed that PRP reduces the risk of visual loss compared to observation. And with proper treatment, less than 5% of eyes will develop blindness. So uh, that treatment has uh, withstood the, you know, the test of time and has been the treatment of, for PDR over the last four decades. It is known that it substantially reduces the risk of severe visual loss. However, PRP is inherently destructive. And one of the uh, side effects is that it will uh, cause peripheral visual field loss, night visual loss, exacerbation of preexistent DME, and it's not perfect. Around 5% will still experience severe visual loss, which is defined as worse than 5 to 100 at two consecutive visits, despite PRP. Uh, and more recently in the past decade, we've seen uh, the use of anti-VEGF drugs, particularly in the use of uh, diabetic macular uh, edema. And we have also seen that in those eyes, uh, the anti-VEGF will uh, decrease the risk of diabetic retinopathy worsening and increases the chance of improved retinopathy level. So it is interesting to see whether or not uh, if one starts treatment of PDR with anti-VEGF, will it delay or prevent the need for PRP? So that is the question. And fortunately, we have a couple of uh, studies that we can look into and guide us with this information. The first study that I'd like to uh, discuss is the CLARITY study which was a phase 2B single blind non inferiority trial conducted in the UK. And here we have a little bit over 100 eyes that received a flivver step every four weeks for the first three months, three consecutive, and then they were followed on a PRN basis compared to 116 eyes that underwent PRP from the beginning. Uh, here are the... Uh, what the, the study design and the primary outcome, you can see that this was defined to see whether or not the visual acuity uh, from baseline to a year 52 weeks uh, were different between the two groups. And the exclusion criteria, I will call to your attention here that the V size DME uh, was uh, expressly uh, forbidden for the eyes to have a DME. <clears throat> Again, this is the uh, design of the study. So here we see two arms, a flibercep and PRP. And then these were received uh, uh, three uh, monthly injections of, <clears throat> excuse me, of a flibercep, and then were followed PRN and the PRP arm. And then they were subdivided in groups of whether or not they had treatment IU PDR or active PDR. Uh, that had uh, prior PRP. And then they were followed for uh, a year's time. And uh, what were the uh, follow-up and treatment schedules? You can see here, again, that the design of the study was three monthly injections, and then uh, patients were followed on a PRN basis. And then in the PRP arm, they were followed every 12 weeks uh, from, uh, I'm sorry, every eight weeks after the third month. These are the retreatment criteria, depending on whether or not there was regression of the PDR. And you can see if there was complete regression, simply there was no treatment in either arm. If there was partial regression or reactivation in the flibercept arm, they continue with the uh, flibercept therapy. And in the PRP, they had additional PRP at the discretion of the uh, investigator. 
if there was no regression, then uh, the flippers that arm received also PRP. And in the PRP uh, arm, they just uh, continue receiving uh, laser treatment. Again, this is study, uh, this uh, slide just goes on to show that the groups were well balanced at the beginning of the study. And uh, the results here, we can see that uh, in the PRP group, uh, the patients uh, lost maybe a letter or so. Uh, I'm sorry, they lost uh, around uh, three letters at the end of 52 weeks compared to the flivercep uh, arm that gained around 1.1 to 1.3 letters. And here in this plot, we can see that in terms of visual acuity, um, the, the flivercep eyes gain more vision than the eyes uh, that receive PRP. And this is on the order of maybe almost a line in uh, best corrected visual acuity. In terms of patients who had gain or losses of uh, more than two uh, lines of uh, best corrected visual acuity at a year's time, again, the numbers favor the uh, flivercep. Here are the gainers and here are the losers. And we can see that the flivercep eye uh, did better than the PRP arm. And when we look at the uh, disease regression patterns at a year's time, again, you can see that the numbers favor the aflibercep arm where they had uh, better anatomic uh, results than the uh, laser eyes. Uh, the, these are the eyes that develop uh, macular edema after being enrolled in the study. And you can see that uh, more eyes in the PRP arm developed macular edema compared to the aflibercep arm. And in terms of vitreous hemorrhage, again, the uh, eyes in the uh, aflibercep eye, uh, arm did better than the eyes in the laser arm as well. Uh, here, after uh, one year of treatment, you can see that patients receive on average 4.4 injections uh, throughout uh, the treatment. And uh, here is uh, uh, the type of treatment that these eyes receive in the laser arm. You can see that about two thirds of eyes had the multi-spot laser treatment, whether around a third uh, received only the monospot uh, conventional laser treatment. And uh, of all these eyes in the PRP arm, all patients had uh, a little bit over uh, one extra laser session needed. So in summary, for the clarity, uh, the mean change in visual acuity with a, a flivver step therapy was superior to PRP. Fewer patients lost 10 or more letters with a flivver step than with PRP, and significantly fewer patients in the flivver step group developed a macular edema compared with the PRP. There was also less chance of vitreous hemorrhage with a flivver step therapy than with PRP, and uh, the supplemental PRP was rarely required with a flibercept being done in 2% of patients only. So uh, we move on to the next study, and this is the protocol S from the DCR net. And this, is, uh, this study is a little bit different than the uh, prior study. Uh, they had uh, longer follow-up. Uh, for one, they had follow-up up to five years, whereas in the CLARITY study, we only had follow-up for one year. And here, um, uh, DME eyes were also included. They were allowed to enroll in the study. So again, the, the primary outcome was at two years, and it was the visual acuity. Um, there were other secondary uh, outcomes that we see listed here in the slide. And Uh, for those eyes that had DME uh, and, and they were enrolled at the beginning of the study, uh, ranibizumab uh, was given. And uh, if the patient developed DME during the study, depending on which arm they were uh, allocated to, uh, one would either use a ranibizumab or focal grid laser uh, according to the protocol I. Uh, criteria. 
So uh, in this study, in the protocol S, uh, patients in the PRP group, after the PRP, they were seen every 16 weeks, whereas the patients with the ranibizumab group, they were seen every four weeks. Uh, and uh, if both, uh, if eyes uh, were randomized to the PRP group and had DME, they had to be also treated uh, with the ranibizumab uh, at the same time. So this is a little bit different from the clarity. These eyes received six uh, monthly injections uh, consecutively. And uh, then at the month six, uh, they could uh, assess whether or not uh, the neovascularization had improved or not. And you could defer the injections if it was stable and the injections were withheld if, uh, <clears throat> if uh, uh, everything was stable. It would resume if uh, the patient worsened. The PRP group received one, uh, the PRP treatment in, within eight weeks of randomization. And if they had the DME, they had to receive also the, uh, uh, the ranibizumab. So here, this slide tells us after five years, and I'd like to call your attention to the people returning after five years. And you can see that both arms, only 60% of patients return. So there's a lot of uh, uh, loss to follow up in this randomized clinical trial. I will now go over the results at five years. And you can see that uh, these are the number of injections that each group received throughout the five years. And obviously in the ranibizumab group, there were more injections, but after the first year, uh, the number of injections and then to decrease. Whereas in the RP group, uh, on that same thing, they receive more injections in the first year and then also gradually decrease as the disease was brought under control. Uh, these are the eyes uh, that uh, received PRP during follow up, and you can see that up to 14% of the eyes with the anti VEGF receive also uh, laser treatment. Whereas in the laser group, a half of them uh, also receive more laser. So the concept of maybe, you know, that you maybe have heard that uh, laser treatment is one, a one-time deal uh, apparently doesn't hold in this clinical study. Many eyes around half will still require laser treatment uh, after the first uh, treatment. And here we look at the visual acuity at five years. And you can see the comparison between the ranibizumab arm and the PRP group. And you can see that overall, we had great visual acuities in both arms, 2025. And uh, you know, they're very comparable, the visual outcomes at five years in the two arms of the study. Here we, uh, we see uh, the time course of that visual acuity gain. And we can see that at least during the first couple of years, it seems that there was a particular advantage of the eyes that received uh, the ranibizumab compared to the laser, but at five years, they were virtually identical with the visual acuities in both arms. <clears throat> when we look at the visual fields, you will recall that with laser, we're destroying part of the peripheral retina so it is expected that you will have some visual field defects. And indeed, that seems the case when we look at the visual field total point score that the laser eyes did worse than the eyes that received the ranibizumab. But after five, after two years, it seems that the loss in the uh, laser group sort of plateaus out, whereas in the ranibizumab arm, for some unknown reason, there starts to be a visual field decline, and this may have to do more with the natural history of the disease than uh, treatment per se. <clears throat> when we look here at the retinal detachments, uh, again, uh, the PRP group had more retinal detachments than the ranibizumab. Uh, when we look at the vitreous hemorrhage, 
both uh, both arms uh, are fairly similar in terms of uh, the degree of uh, new vitreous hemorrhage that occur in these eyes. So the results in summary uh, would show us that uh, the are very similar in terms of the visual outcomes be, uh, between the two groups and the change in visual field uh, was better for the ranibizumab, although you know, with time, uh, the ranibizumab arm also had some visual field defects. In terms of uh, the development of DME, you can see here that uh, the, uh, there were more eyes that developed DME in the PRP group. Uh, more eyes develop, uh, uh, underwent vitrectomy in the PRP group, uh, but there were really no big uh, differences between these. So in conclusion, uh, one of the major problems, uh, despite this being a clinical trial, was the loss to follow-up that was very high with these uh, two groups. And the visual acuity in most study eyes that completed the follow-up was very good. The severe visual loss or serious PDR complications were uncommon in either group. And, uh, you know, these findings support either the ranibizumab or PRP as viable treatments for PDR. So uh, when we choose, decide to choose which treatment to entertain in each particular patient, we need to take into account patient-specific factors, including anticipated visit, compliance, the number of visits, cost, and the systemic health. There are several advantages of PRP, and one of these is that you're typically able to be complete in one or two visits. Usually this is an often a long lasting effect requiring no additional treatment. However, as uh, shown in this study, about 45% of eyes had to be given additional PRP after the initial PRP was completed, and it may cost less than ranibizumab injections. There's no risk of endophthalmitis, no risk of systemic exposure to anti-VEGF. What are the advantages of ranibizumab? Uh, we see that the advantages is that the visual acuity from baseline to two years was no worse than with PRP. They had a superior mean visual acuity over the course of two years, and uh, they had good results overall. So this was uh, published in JAMA uh, in 2015. So we have that information. But what happens in the real world? And uh, something concerning has come up and it has to do with uh, patients that don't show up to clinic. And uh, this is a report from the Willside Clinic where they follow these patients, over 2000 patients with PDR that receive either PRP or individual anti-VEGF. And these patients uh, didn't come back uh, for 12 months. And over four years, 28% of the patients of these uh, patients were treated with PRP and 22% with anti-VEGF uh, were lost to follow-up. And when these patients returned again, uh, you can see that there was a greater number of eyes that showed up with a tractional retinal detachment and neovascularization of the iris in the eyes that had treatment with anti-VEGF than the PRP group. Uh, another paper, this one uh, from the group in Michigan, uh, again, they looked at different patients that were treated uh, with PRP or anti-VEGF and lost to follow-up. And uh, they mentioned that patients are non-compliant or treatment, they had treatment interruption for several reasons. You know, uh, there are listed here. You can see the complications that uh, occur after they return to treatment. And most of these eyes, you know, had um, uh, visual acuity that was not uh, able to be recovered uh, with uh, almost half of these patients having a best corrected visual acuity with hand motion of worse. These were the eyes that um, were treated solely with anti vegf and not ERP. And last, uh, what I'd like to mention is that uh, in the real world setting, diabetic patients underutilize eye care services. They are prone to significant lapses in follow-up. And you can have an anticipated events that can affect even the most reliable patients. Uh, in the US, 10 million uh, diabetics are evaluated in the ER annually. Then nearly 6 million are hospitalized 
and almost half with patients with DME had at least one loss to follow up up to more than 100 days. And uh, as I mentioned, about a third of patients in protocol S, despite being in the clinical trial, were lost to follow up at five years. So in summary, the visual loss from PDR has been significantly decreased by PRP, but PRP is inherently destructive and VEGF inhibitors cause progression of the intraocular neovascularization, but need to be given on a fairly regular basis. And the interruption of anti-VEGF treatment can be catastrophic and lead to irreversible blindness. For those of you who want to dwell a little bit more in detail, uh, we uh, sort of uh, reviewed this uh, topic in this publication. I thank you all for your attention. Right, it gives me a great pleasure to, uh, to introduce the last speaker. I think that most of you will know Paolo Stenka extremely well, that um, most of you will probably uh, remember him from uh, Manchester, that he had been a consultant for many years and become professor there. But uh, recently that uh, um, Paolo have actually now moved to the retinal clinic in London um, in 140 Harley Street. And as you know that he specialized in both surgical retina and medical retina, in particular with macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy. And today that he's particular talking about uh, the laser therapy for vitreous floaters, but he's also um, have interest in cataract retinal laser and also uh, in new treatment, both in medical and surgical side. And he had a lot of experience in retinal imaging and also uh, developing surgical uh, in clinical trial technique and also in, um, uh, in the research uh, activities. Hello, give it away and looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Let me share with you uh, our experience in the diagnosis and management uh, of uh, vitreous opacities. These are my commercial associations. I have an association with uh, Quantel, of course, and uh, several imaging companies. From an embryology point of view, it is at only four weeks that uh, the hyaloid uh, vascular system starts to appear. We first develop a vascularized cellular primary vitreous. By weeks 35, 36, there is complete regression of the hyaloid system and atrophy of this primary vitreous. By six uh, uh, to 13 weeks, there is a, an, a cellular secondary vitreous that uh, a cellular secondary vitreous pushes the primary vitreous towards the center and of the eye. And this forms the walls of Broquette's canal that runs from the optic nerve head to the posterior lens capsule and contains the remnants of the hyaloid artery and the primary vitreous. The anatomy of the vitreous, opposite to what uh, most people uh, think, it's quite complex. In the 70s, Eisner described membranelles and borscht cisterns. Sebak and Valash identified fibers in the 80s. In the 90s, Kish and Shimizu found pockets in the vitreous. Here you can see a diagram showing uh, the area of Marjani, uh, Croquet's Canal. We have to remember this anatomy because it is essential to understanding why we suffer a PVD and vitreous floaters. In 2014, we published our work imaging in vivo, the cortical vitreous using swept source uh, uh, OCD imaging. There was a new way of imaging the vitreous in the past. Uh, Borscht had used uh, uh, milk or ink uh, in cadaveric eyes to image the systems. Here we showed how you could uh, uh, achieve visualization in vivo. And this was thanks to the use of swept source OCD, which allowed fast imaging speed. And because we were using infrared light and, and fast imaging, we were able to bypass uh, the effect of uh, the collagen in scattering light and also the uh, movement of the eye. We have to remember that there are no direct connections between the posterior vitreous and the retina. The vitreous is most firmly attached where the eye lens is, at, is the thinnest. That is the vitreous base, the optic disc, the macula and the blood vessels. It is not totally clear what the physiological functions of the vitreous are. There's evidence of regulation to, of eye growth and shape. 
uh, it could have an impact on lowering oxygen concentration in the lens as oxidative stress leads to cataract formation and possibly also glaucoma. So why is the vitreous gel? And this is mainly due to the architecture of the collagen fibers and the presence of hyaluronin that fills the gaps between the collagen fibers. Here we see uh, work of Jerry Sevak showing the difference in those uh, two images between the vitreous of a four-year-old and a 40-year-old patient, much more fibular as we get older. Also, you can see how the, there is aggregation of uh, fibers uh, in the vitreous as the vitreous uh, ages. Vitreous floaters, uh, we call them myodosopsia from the Greek or musca volitantis from the Latin. It's really an endoptic phenomenon. It's a visual phenomenon caused by dark, uh, by vitreous opacities producing linear gray shadows with focal dark spot or nodules. They move with the eye and head movements and are more visible against the bright background. Hence the difficulties that we face nowadays as we are using more and more backlit uh, screens. What do we know so far about vitreous opacities? We know that the vitreous is comprised mainly of water, there's an extracellular matrix and collagen fibers. The collagen fibers are mixed with hyaluronin and there's higher density of hyaluronin in the vitreous cortex. I mentioned uh, a couple of seconds ago endoptic phenomena. And endoptic phenomena are the visual sensations produced by structures within the eye. And this could be uh, retinal phosphines, uh, flying spots, the blue retinal arcs, etc. Floaters are an endoptic phenomenon. What we are seeing is the shadow cast by uh, either clusters of collagen fibers. Uh, or the interface between the uh, cortex, uh, posterior cortex, and the and, and fluid. We know that as we age, uh, we can see more pack bundles of collagen fiber fibers that are formed from visible fibers. They become more numerous, thickened, more irregular with age. We know that when there is a posterior vitreous detachment or PVD. There's uh, light is scattered uh, due to the high density of the collagen fibers in the uh, vitreous cortex. This is again work from uh, Jerry Sebak. We know that by the age of 40, there's a firm connection between hyaluronin and, 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 and collagen fibers, uh, which loosens up. The hyaluronin uh, reduces, the gel shrinks, the vitreous decreases, while liquid increases. By the age of 80, roughly 62% of the vitreous has liquefied. And once there is more than 60% liquefaction, there's increased risk of PVD or posterior vitreous detachment. We have to remember myopic vitreopathy. Uh, uh, myopia is increasing, uh, and we know that there are internal structural abnormalities that are uh, characteristic of the myopic eye. There can be incomplete regression of the fetal hyaloid vessels, which may impact phototransmission to the retina causing myodosopsia. There are also structural changes in the myopic eye that start from an earlier age compared to an anatropic eye. The uh, hyaluronic molecules dissociate from the uh, collagen fibers and the collagen fibers from bundles that we see as vitreous floaters. All of this happens at an earlier age than in an emetropic eye. There are constant shear stresses in the myopic vitreous that pull away from the retina. It's important to remember that PVD tends to occur 10 to 13 years earlier in a highly myopic eye compared to an emetropic eye. So what are the risks for uh, posterior detachment? Well, the main one is aging uh, with, due to vitreous liquefaction or uh, myopia. The vitreal retinal addition weakens as the internal limited membrane thickens with age or in the diabetic eye. Female gender is a possible one. Surgical aphakia, uh, cer certainly cataract surgery brings forward uh, PVD. The prevalence of posterior detachment is 1.5 in patients 
age 49 compared to 100% in patients aged over 90. It's easy to diagnose a posterior vitreous detachment in the presence of a vice ring. The vice ring is the, uh, the vitreous cortex that was placed around the optic nerve head. How do we diagnose a PVD? Again, as I just mentioned, easy when we see a vice ring on by microscopy, but we can use ultrasonography, OCT. We can rely on the symptoms, um, a sudden onset of uh, floaters, uh, the shadow caused by the vice ring. As we can see, increasing liquefaction induces loss of architectural strength in the vitreous and their PVD. And as uh, Sebak's group has shown, a posterior vitreous attachment leads to degradation of contrast uh, sensitivity function. And this is part of what we call VDM or vision degrading myodesopsia. We know that clinically significant floaters are present in uh, around 44% of patients with myopic vitropathy. And they can have a substantial uh, effect on patients' uh, vision and quality of life. The incidence of myopia is rapidly increasing. And this is uh, well known, for example, in Southeast Asia, children increasingly using backlit, backlit screens and relying on monitors are increasing uh, the rate of uh, myopia. By 2050, nearly 5 billion people will uh, uh, be myopic and 1 billion will suffer from high myopia. As we get older with time, floaters move towards the lens and may become less troublesome. The brain, interestingly, does not adapt to floaters. Now, what can we do about this? Vitreous floaters can significantly impact on vision. And as we can see here, the red, uh, the, sorry, the green arrows clearly point towards the shadow caused by the floaters. Uh, as you can see on the right hand corner uh, uh, image directly uh, a, a cone of shadow over the phobia. And on the uh, 3D renderings, you can see loss of information due to shadow cast by the vitreous floater. And the vitreous floater, as you can see on the left hand uh, corner image, is this floater's vitreous opacity is in the middle of the vitreous cavity in the absence of a posterior vitreous detachment. There's a cleavage plane between the posterior co uh, cortical vitreous, but not a posterior vitreous detachment. Again, what can we do? Well, most people are still, uh, most patients are still told that the, no treatment is available. Just leave with it. But why? Vitreous opacities are not always visible to the examiner. And this is one of the main problems, in my opinion. The impact of vitreous opacities is still not well understood. We need to improve vitreous visualization techniques, especially visualization of vitreous opacities and PVD. We have to be objective when we diagnose a PVD. It's not just because a patient suffers from sudden onset of uh, floaters that the patient develops a PVD. So let me show you an example. This is a patient of mine. She's an artist and she's very symptomatic in the right eye. As you can see, the cross-sectional scan of the OCT shows a, a posterior vitreous attachment, a vice ring is present, a 3D rendering, rendering of 23 millimeter long single scan white velocity clearly shows the detached uh, posterior uh, cortical vitreous. You can see the decreases in the posterior cortical vitreous and you can see the vice ring. This is a new way of uh, imaging the vitreous that we are uh, developing uh, in conjunction with an imaging company. And here it is quite obvious that this patient suffers from uh, myodesopsia, that this patient suffers from a vision degrading myodesopsia, and large vitreous floaters moves in front of the macula as the eye moves. There's no doubts about this, the patient with a, with a PVD. Now, let's look at the other eye, 
of this patient. This, this is the same patient, I've, I've just shown you the right eye, the left eye is asymptomatic. There is no posterior vitreous detachment in this left eye. The vitreous appears clear in the wide uh, uh, field, uh, a multi wavelength image, and the 3D rendering also appears clear. However, when we look at this type of imaging, we can clearly see that this patient also shows vitreous floaters. The interesting thing is that she is not symptomatic in this left eye. Now, there are other patients with this amount of floaters that are very symptomatic. And in my opinion, the difference between the two eyes is the fact that the right eye shows a posterior vitreous detachment and this asymptomatic eye does not. So PVD is extremely uh, important with regards to the presence or not of symptoms, in my opinion. Now, laser for the treatment of floaters has been around for decades, but has never convinced retinal ophthalmologists. It's been mainly anterior segment surgeons who have looked into uh, treating uh, uh, vitreous floaters with YAG. However, the YAC technology that has been available until now was not really developed for, to, for the treatment of vitreous floaters. It was developed for uh, posterior capsulotum. Now, with the uh, uh, Elix uh, Quantel Ultra Q Reflex uh, uh, system, we, the beam of light and the laser beam follow the same path. So we can go deep inside the eye. We have a big advantage for the treatment of vitreous floaters. We can disrupt not only the vitreous flow opacities, but also the strands of vitreous from which these vitreous floaters are, appear to be hanging. It's a, it's a non-surgical option. It uh, 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 provides improvement ranging between 38 to 63% uh, of uh, patients. Let me show you some, uh, a diagrammatic representation showing the advantage of, the, uh, of sharing the same path for the illumination and the uh, laser beam. Therefore, we can treat, we can visualize clearly not only the anterior vitreous, but also the or the cortical vitreous, we can visualize from the uh, lens to the retina in detail. Here you can see a, uh, a very fast uh, uh, high speed uh, film recording showing the action of the mirror, uh, the illumination mirror moving down when the laser is fired. The plasma that is produced displaced, and displaces anteriorly opposite to when we treat uh, with a standard uh, laser. We use a contact lens to deliver the treatment. You can see that we use a high energy ranging between three to, uh, to seven uh, millijoules. When, when I treat the middle of the vitreous cavity, I tend to use five millijoules. We want to leave a safety area of approximately three millimeters uh, behind the lens and in front of the retina to avoid collateral damage. I presented our initial results uh, at the last uh, Jules Gonan meeting with uh, over one year of uh, follow-up and no complications with uh, adequate uh, patient uh, satisfaction. This is one of my patients uh, that uh, here you can see the settings that I used. This was, why, this was the very first patient that I treated. I was being extremely uh, cautious using very low energy. Today, I will be using five uh, uh, millijoules. Uh, 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 and here I needed two sessions. It's a fibrotic uh, vice ring. And uh, uh, the first thing I'm doing is breaking it up, sectioning, sectioning it into a string. And uh, you can see here how then I am in, session, in the second session, 
I am vaporizing most of it. This, is, this was the very first patient I treated. The uh, patient was very happy. And this is the, the letter that he sent me afterwards. Uh, he was uh, back driving. And for him, this was uh, the, mo the, the most important benefit from, from the patient. Now, I think a full retroretinal examination prior to uh, carrying out the, the treatment is essential. All of my patients undergo indirect ophthalmoscopy with 360 degrees clear We certainly want to make sure that there are no peripheral retinal lesions that could predispose the patient to uh, retinal detachment. Another option is limited vitrectomy. Uh, limited vitrectomy is different from the traditional full vitrectomy. We do not uh, actively induce uh, posterior vitreous detachment. We do not actively uh, go uh, towards the periphery to try to remove the peripheral uh, uh, vitreous. This is a patient with, as you can see, bilateral, very large vice rings with possibly an attached avals epirentinal membrane. Uh, it's a patient that, uh, from Germany that I treated with uh, limited vitrectomy. Uh, he drives a, 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 a very fast A911. And uh, this is uh, six months in the post-op uh, period. Uh, he's extremely happy and tells me to be able to drive even faster. I would like to um, uh, turn your attention to this paper by uh, this couple of papers by Jeffrey Heyer's uh, team, uh, uh, at look, uh, looking at a randomized clinical trial uh, of uh, Yagley's vitrolysis uh, with a long-term follow-up uh, of uh, and finding that the efficacy uh, was maintained at 2.3 uh, years. We cannot do this alone. We need to work together to defeat uh, floaters. So there are many of us that are uh, taking on this technology and I highly encourage you to uh, add this to your armamentarium. Uh, uh, Yak may not be the option for every patient, but we, we need to have choices. Patients need to be offered as many choices as possible. I would like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors and, 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 and those who have contributed to some of the material in this presentation. Uh, Ursula Reinstein, who is my research assistant. Uh, Puja Vatas, my uh, lead uh, retinal nurse. Jerry, with whom I've uh, uh, set up this uh, uh, future study that we're starting, starting imminently. And Professor David McLeod and Bishop, who have contributed to some of this material. Uh, so we need your floaters, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for uh, uh, listening to us. Uh, Victor, uh, thank you for that excellent presentation. Uh, Professor Wu had, Wu had to go to, uh, into theater. Victor, uh, would you like to make uh, any uh, comments, uh, add anything to what uh, we've presented? Yeah, no, but that, that was a fascinating talk that you gave, Paolo, Paolo. and uh, really interesting to see how a, a new way of uh, dealing with vitreous throaters. Thank you very much, Victor, for uh, uh, your uh, comments, and thank you for showing uh, this uh, uh, new technology and how you uh, treat uh, diabetic macular edema and, uh, and CSR with uh, subthreshold laser. Uh, uh, Best of luck with your new subthreshold laser uh, society. And uh, thank you very much again for participating from this uh, symposium. We would like to thank Quantel again for organizing uh, uh, and sponsoring this event and for inviting us. And we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you very much. Thank you.